My sister asked me what, what I wanted to do, and I said I was gonna be an NFL player. She bust out laughing, bust out laughing, ran out the door. I'm like, why not? Why not? He was a living, breathing, havoc wreaking paradox. You just knew you were not gonna block him every time. Sack by word sack. He was relentless. A man who exuded charisma and intimidation. There were moments where he dominated. Overpowering size and surprising grace. Warren changed the way that position was played. Who brought to a once bleak franchise controversy. You know, you. And also glory. We're well, gonna win the Super Bowl. From the halls of Apopka High School to the halls of Canton, his energy was boundless, his ability limitless, and his sheer force of will and personality relentless. I was just looking at how cheap the gas was right there. What cheap it is? Three forty-four. That ain't cheap. That is too cheap. No, yeah, that that's like fifty cent over anybody oh, okay. else. Yeah, that one right there. That station. Come on. It say green. Oh, let, green. Let me, yeah, let me know the light's green. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Carlos Sapp was born in December of 1972. He grew up just 10 miles from Orlando in the tiny hamlet of Plymouth, Florida. Right now, we're on our way into Plymouth, eight miles. The youngest of six children, at nine pounds, six ounces, he was a big baby. They say she carried me for a year. You talk to my aunt or any of them, they tell a story all the time. And they say I came out pretty much standing up, head up and everything. They was like, you got to go see this boy over here. He got his head up and everything. I would say he never was a baby. He was a little boy, born young. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but he was a good big baby. And he was a good boy growing up. We are at the home where Warren grew up in. And it used to be 26 Barrett Drive, and his mom went down to the county and had it changed to Warren Sapp Drive. We call it the dirt. Come from the dirt, the clay, nothing. Just open fields and not even a stoplight. <laughs> not a McDonald's, the piece of man didn't deliver, no cable. <laughs> Determined to provide for her kids the best life she could, Annie worked up to four jobs to make ends meet. Not an easy undertaking for a single mother of six. Last time I saw my dad was, I was 30. And before that, I was 11. He wasn't there and it wasn't something that I was missing. I always said that my mom was my dad and my mom because I feared her more than I feared any man. <laughs> and that's just the, that's the God the honest truth. I, I feared her to death. He was obedient. He wasn't tough to keep in line because once I told him something to do and he didn't do it, I would line him up. And then from then on, he knew mama didn't play. But Warren's older brothers did. Arnell and Parnell were standout running backs in high school and college and Warren idolized their football prowess, and he learned from them too, just outside the back door. But right now what you're looking at was my Super Bowl. This is the greatest field I knew right here, with me and my brothers played right here. That was my cathedral, you know, my yard, and whenever they got off from work, I'd, I'd attack them at the door. I'm gonna get me a win. <laughs> Larger contests were settled just down the street, the two fields I used to play in, this one here was the big field. <laughs> this is the big field. That was like the, <laughs> the Taj Mahal. But this right here, right here, where we get dusty right here. Where y'all used to be right there? Right there. That's the Dust Bowl. That's why I spent most of my afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, anytime I had to go play, right here. Yeah. 
I'm no more than 80 feet from home, and if she yelled, I heard her, so. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Yeah. yeah. It's number dirt. We call it the dust bowl, because there wasn't no grass. <laughs> we, it's dirt. And we'd be out there, and all of a sudden, <laughs> big dust bowl. I mean, it's a big cloud of dust. I mean, we just going at it, and the dust would be all over us, all over our clothes, I mean. It was our playpen, and it was nothing fabulous, but boy, did we not know it. <laughs> I mean, we knew nothing else. When you talk about somebody that came from the dirt, I came from the dirt. Playing in the neighborhood was one thing, but to Warren's mother, organized football was a whole different animal. He wanted to play, he played out there with his friends and with his brothers, so that was good enough for me. But to go on a football field, no put on those helmets and people knocking and clacking and stuff, no. Well, he had a friend named Troy Rainey, and him and Troy was at school one day in South Moyer. It was the first day of school, and I'm getting ready to walk out the school door, and Troy's like, where you going? I'm like, what? He's like, I'm like, where you going? He's like, I'm going to go play football. And I'm like, I'm going to get on the bus go home. He's like, no, you ain't. So I had to call the school where she was working and ask her, could I play? I'm almost there. She's like, go ahead, and hung up the phone. So I push him, we run. Run straight to the locker room. I'm playing football. And who better to guide the budding talent than the same man who mentored his superstar brothers? He was a different kind of coach, the perfect foil to Warren's bold persona. Chip was like that fun uncle. When I got my opportunity to be with him, it was the absolute best. I mean, I love him. I knew there was something special with Warren and we had a great relationship. Any high school coach wants the best available talent on his team, and Warren was one of those guys. But it was much more so than that for me, is that I wanted these kids at Apopka to go on and have a future, and I knew that he had it. He was a terrific basketball player, could have played baseball, so he had that kind of athletic ability for a big guy. I played everything. I punted, and played outside linebacker, and I played uh, tight end. Never came off the field. That was the only way we always played. That was like the dust bowler in the backyard. There wasn't anybody better. So why should I come off the field? While his on-field abilities were honed to a sharp edge, the young man from Plymouth still had a lesson to learn about respect and discipline. Sapp disagreed with his coach's run-heavy play calling one game, and he let Gerke know. I said, listen. You run that ball three more times, and I'm coming off this field. Oh, yeah? He ran it three more times. I came from about right there. Got right here to his face. Took my pads off and slammed him right here on the ground. Blew. Stan's a fool. You hear me? Fool. I go, plow, and walk right off the field. Then go inside, get my clothing, and go right out the damn stadium. That could have been the last football story I could have ever been telling you in my life. What an idiot I was. I'm not going to allow a kid to fail, and I'm not going to allow one episode to let him fail, regardless of what anybody thinks. It might not be anybody else's coaching philosophy to do that, but it's been mine my entire career. No other coach would have let me do what I did and take you back. If it wasn't him and it wasn't my family with my mom and my brother and our history with him, nah. It's pretty neat the fact that from that point that we had the incident, that it was him that saw the light. It, you know, I provided the opportunity, but he took advantage of it. It takes a little mistakes like that and people giving you a second chance to have your life roll out in front of you. And I'm glad I can stand here today. He finally realized that football was his ticket. And just maybe as important was that he wanted to go to college and get an education. I got to get out of here. This is my shot. And I was grabbing it. I was grabbing it. I wasn't going to let nothing stop me from getting there. Coming up on A Football Life, 
Nobody dreamed we could get a player of Warren Sepp's caliber, and when he dropped to our position, it was a miracle. If you went back to Plymouth, nine times out of ten, you'd be on the tree. You was gonna be up there doing nothing, getting off at five o'clock, coming to the tree. Buying you a beer at the local store, coming to the tree. Oh, uh, I can't believe it. Tree was the place for drunks, fast women, party. They would shoot dice, play cards, domino. It was just some place in Plymouth that I wouldn't allow my children to go to, and I didn't even go there. If she wasn't gonna let me hang out here and it was the same people that was gonna be there for the next 40 years, then why would I wanna be there? So this is the one place that motivated me to get the hell out of here. This the tree. Long before he wreaked havoc on offensive lines and in NFL backfields, Warren Sapp made waves as a standout tight end, linebacker, kicker, and punter at Apopka High School in Florida. Colleges around the nation, and especially in the state of Florida, took notice. Warren Sapp had offers from Florida, Florida State, Ohio State, and one of the recruiters from Miami, he said, what do you think, coach? And I said, I, I know he's got it at, at a high level. I said, there's just not many kids that are this big, this agile, this much balance, this much athleticism, and he agreed. Dennis Erickson wanted me. That was the thing. I was at the high school watching my girl play basketball. <laughs> the phone rang because my mom knew the phone number to the, to the pay phone. That's how crazy it was. You could call pay phones then. You know this? <laughs> hey, what's up? This man sitting on my couch. Where you at? Who's sitting on the couch? This Erickson man. I'm on my way. That man, Dennis Erickson, drove to my home and asked me to become a Miami Hurricane. There was nowhere in hell I wasn't going. The other colleges never did mention education. And the lady was named Anna. She said, Miss Sapp said, you don't have to worry about Warren's grade, because if he don't come up to par, I will personally let you know. And that sold me right then. Sapp was redshirted his freshman year. And by the time he suited up for the 1992 season, he had gained 70 pounds. There wasn't much need for a 300-pound tight end in Miami, but the coaching staff had other plans for Sapp. Bob Carmelowitz comes to me and says, son, I'm gonna need you to try defensive tackle. That's you crazy. I never put my hand in the dirt. I don't know what y'all doing out there. I'm, the only time I do is help my tackle with the little end with a hand push and go seal the linebacker. That's, that's all I know about the D-line. I push the end over and I, I go get the guy. He said, yeah, and you good at it. I wanna see, can you stop somebody from pushing you over in the three technique? I'm like, what? Get away from my face. He say, son, you want to come down. I've seen you move. You'll be great. He returns and wheels and gets hit. Warren Sapp out of Blue Florida and Apopka High School. And the system fit like a glove for him because, you know, he is so hard to block. He's, you know, he's so low. He's got such speed and agility and quickness. I mean, it just was a natural. That was the position. That's where the bad boys played. That was Russell's spot, that was Cortez's spot. All the badasses at Miami played right tackle, and it was my spot. And it was 4-3, hit it and get it. <laughs> Trample the run on your way to the quarterback. Back and looking, rolling, gonna be hit and drop. Under Miami's system, the All-American defensive tackle thrived, earning numerous collegiate honors, including the Lombardi Award, the Bronco Nagurski Trophy, and Defensive Player of the Year. Ready for a new challenge, Sapp decided to enter the NFL draft after his junior season. He couldn't have dominated the game any more than he did at the college level. He won every award, had all the hardware, and was the best player, I thought, in college football at his time, and was ready, and, and should have been the first pick of the draft. But it was one piece of the draft that always set uneasy with me, is when they asked me to come to New York. And I was like, no, I'm gonna be in Plymouth, in the backyard, Good buddy on the grill, the beers flowing, me and my people, you know? 
because that's what it was about for me. Me and my people, I was going to retire my mother. I was going to take my mother from this little yellow shack, and I was going to put her in a nice place with a nice Mercedes Benz out front, and she wasn't going to have to work no more. I mean, he could have left me in Plymouth. Sap went to New York, but as he feared, things didn't go well. The night before the draft, erroneous reports surfaced that he had failed multiple drug tests, allegations that had been disproven a month earlier. The reports were out of control. They were not accurate. We were still confident going into draft day, but we had no idea that he would fall out of the top 10. With the 11th pick in the first round, the Minnesota Vikings select defensive end from Florida State, Derek Alexander. Well, there's no mystery anymore. Derek Alexander is a fine player, but certainly was not as high up as Warren Sapp. Hey, let's go to Craig James. Craig? Warren, right now, the emotions. I mean, it's just a tough situation. I'm just sitting here waiting around, but I mean, it's not that tough. Right. You're uh, Drew, Drew Rosenhaus as the agent. What are you hearing on the phones right now? Well, my phone's ringing right now, so I think it's going to be any second. Literally, this could be the key call. It's Sam Weiss on the phone. Yeah, we're thinking about drafting you. And I'm like, you thinking? You the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, buddy. You've had 11 straight double-digit loss seasons the last time I checked. I looked at this phone like, I want to hang this damn thing up so bad. But it's been 2 hours and 45 minutes, so <laughs> let's get this over with. <laughs> Nobody dreamed we could get a player of Warren Sepp's caliber, and when he dropped to our position, it was a miracle. Drew, are you surprised that Tampa Bay's the team? Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised, yes. We didn't expect that they would. Uh, we had talked to them pretty extensively, but I didn't think they'd be the team, but at least he's in his home state. He's an hour and a half away from his hometown. Only silver lining in a real, real dirty, dark day in my life was that I would be playing 80 miles from my mother's home, and there wasn't no game she'd miss. I knew that. But Carlo just took it as I'm a Florida boy. I went to high school in Florida. I went to college in Florida. Now I'll play pro football in Florida. Up next on A Football Life. Can you believe Tampa Bay is 1 and 19 lifetime on the West Coast? I looked at Brooks and I say, this stops today. I'll never forget the first time I ever met him, Warren and Derek Brooks, they come busting into this room. He said, hey, Brooks, there's, there's that uh, hard-ass white guy that knocks people out. <laughs> and so I got up, said hello, and uh, he said to me right away, you ready to go win a championship? And I said, let's do it. As eager rookies in Tampa, Sapp and fellow first-round draft pick Derek Brooks were hell-bent on winning. But in 1995, for a team mired in a culture of mediocrity, victory would prove more elusive than anticipated. You're trying to figure out how we gonna get this thing turned around because it's 11 straight double digit loss seasons. So I see Lynch, I see Brooks, that's okay. We can force this thing because I'm not used to losing, you're not used to losing. At the midway point, the Bucks were five and two in first place, but it felt like we were in last place because we wasn't a tight, knit team. And the second half of the season, we went into tanks, and it seems as if it was going to be the same old Bucks. But boy, when Tony Dungy walked in that door, structure was born, and a path was shown. And I loved it. All day long, baby. All day long. We hired Tony Dungy because we needed somebody to turn this team around to make it respectable and to build a winning team. I got to Tampa in 1996, and it was kind of a defeatist attitude. It was a losing culture. Uh, there were talented players there, but they didn't feel like they were going to win, didn't feel like they could win. And that was the thing we had to change around. Dungy and his staff preached a philosophy of discipline and fundamentals, and the young Buccaneers fell in line. Touchdown, Warren Sapp! Things felt different even though the losses continued to stack up. As the lightning bolts get set today to host Tampa Bay, they've won two in a row, they're now six and four. We went out to San Diego. We're watching Chris Berman and the boys do their countdown. He comes on the TV and he says, the San Diego Superchargers play the yucks. Can you believe 
Tampa Bay is 1-19 lifetime on the West Coast. I turned and I looked at Brooks, and I say, this shit stops today. I was upset. He was pissed off. Big difference. I didn't like it. He hated it. We get up. Go down to breakfast. I say, please tell me somebody else just saw what I saw. Watching Chris Berman gut us in front of the nation. This shit stops today. We went out and we got smashed 14 to zip before we even tied our shoes. We down 14 to nothing. Head to the 10, to the 5, down to the goal line. Touchdown, San Diego. And in the past, the team would have folded up. But some guys got on the sideline and said, this is ridiculous. We're a better team than this. We just got to keep playing. And slowly and surely, we fought our way back. And guys didn't give up. And we came back and won the game. The Bucs win. How about the Buccaneers? Now, we didn't go win a world championship that year, but that's when the tide started to turn. In 1997, Dungy led the Bucks to their first winning season in 15 years. The key to their success was the 4-3 defense Warren Sapp thrived in. Now I might just go crazy, <laughs> lose my mind. Dungy's version became known as the Tampa 2. We weren't going to blitz a lot and take a lot of chances. We were going to get our pressure by rushing four guys and having seven defenders, the linebackers and the defensive backs, running free to make tackles. It was all based on defensive line, stopping the run game, and creating pressure on the quarterback. So it was a lineman's dream in a lot of ways because you got a lot of freedom, but along with it came a lot of responsibility. We used to call ourselves piranhas, and then we called ourselves on the defensive line with mongrels, and I was gangers. So we're gonna kick a hole in your great wall, kick your ass, and we wanted to tell a story, and that's the film. I mean, we prided ourselves on that. Young under pressure, he'll be sacked back at the 32 by Warren Sapp. Great defenses to me. They start up the middle, and when you had 99 right there in the middle wreaking havoc and just making life miserable on offensive lines, on quarterbacks, it was just a lot to deal with. Oh, he's sacked by Sam. 1999 was special. Every single game, there were moments where he dominated teams. No call down, sacked by Sam. Dominant, I think, is a word that's thrown around too often. There aren't too many people that dominate at the NFL level. He was dominant, and that year in particular. I will go down, sack by word, sack. I come back 99 and have 12 and a half sacks, and I say, you know what? Right now is my prime chance to carve out my piece in the NFL. I can carve out my low legacy. I can carve out what people think of my playing career right now at this moment. Sapp was voted NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 1999. But while the Tampa defense inched toward perfection, a championship still eluded them. We finally put ourselves in the right frame of mind to go get a championship, because we were forged by fire. And when you forged by fire, it don't get no better than that. It ain't going nowhere. Coming up on A Football Life. Every play, he was touching me, hitting me. He was a disruptor. Under pressure. How many times you sacked far? Eleven. <laughs> what did I know it like that? Eleven. Yeah, Eleven times. I didn't know Warren sacked me. No, it's, it's a joke. Brett Favre in 1996 was a two-time MVP and a world champion. He was the best player in football and in my division. Tony Dungy walked in the room and said, the Green Bay Packers are the target and Brett Favre is yours. Are you ready for the challenge? Not a problem. If I wanted notoriety of the world, getting all over him would, would definitely do it. Under pressure, he'll be sacked by Sam. He was relentless. You just knew you were not gonna block him every time. My just vivid memory of Warren Sapp is every play. He was touching me, hitting me. He was a disruptor. We played some of the most classic battles. There was no other quarterback that did that. I knew I was going to get his best. 
It was a bitter cold day at Lambeau Field when the seeds of this epic rivalry took root. In their first playoff meeting, the boy from Plymouth made his presence known and felt by the league's reigning MVP. Five will go down, sacked by Ward Sack. He's down there kicking and screaming on the ground. Let me out, let me out. I'm holding him down, I'm like, get that ball, get that ball. <laughs> then he pops up and he goes to push me. I'm like, man, get your hands off me. Said, get your hands off me. So then we look, I said, what? I said, what? I said, I'm going to be here all day, playboy. This ain't going nowhere. So now he's got to go to his bitch. So I'm standing there whooping the whole time where he's going. And you come back, I'll be right here waiting. If he and I were to meet on the street corner, dark alley, whatever, I would not be near as brave as I was in that game or in any other game. I had my teammates. I had equipment. I really had protection from everyone, not to mention in, in that game we were playing home. Here's the snap. Here comes pressure. He's running away from me. I go to hack this ball. In some kind of way, I hit him right on the bridge of the nose. He jumps up. You almost broke my nose. I'm like, you have a helmet on. How did I almost break your nose? Look at my nose! And I looked like, ooh, you got a red mark right there. <laughs> that might have been the closest we've ever come to, like, picking a bone between each other or something. But oh my god, it was classic. Sam's gonna get the fire, and he'll bring him down with a sack. Loose football, but it's whistled dead, and Warren Sapp is out playing the Green Bay Packers almost single-handedly. Without that playoff game, Warren Sapp just another guy that's playing the position. That day, everybody identified with two people fighting for their two T's, and it was no malice in it at all. It was all fun joking. Man, we, we playing like two kids, man. As good as he was as a player, he was equally as good as a talker. And if you were not careful, you would get caught up in that and it would take you out of your game. I think that's the brilliance of Warren. He always got under my skin. And the best part about it was he wanted it too. He loved it. You come at me, I'm coming back at you. He would be like, man, I'm gonna be on your face all day for. And I, could, I didn't disagree, but I would say, yeah, but Warren, look at the scoreboard, man. Then all of a sudden there came a point and I was like, uh, well, y'all are winning. So it just rubbing salt into the wound. While the fortunes of their franchises rose and fell, the clashes between these two future legends made for great football and an unexpected friendship. If you'd have told me in 97 or 98 that one day you're gonna look back and you're gonna be talking about Warren in, in a good light and very respectful, I'd have been like, yeah, right. But here I am. The relationship kind of just developed over time. I mean, every sack added to it, every hurry added to it, every jab he would say to me added to it, you know, and just the competitive fire was there for both of us. It was a match made in heaven. Two country boys that really, really, really loved the game. I mean, and loved it on a pure level. A pure level to where, hey, it, you didn't have to pay us. Let's just go out here with our boys and let's go play. Up next on A Football Life. It's it's no! We're gonna win the Super Bowl! Super Bowl baby! We turned Tampa into a champ. We gotta practice doing things right all the time. Little things, huh? Details. Under Tony Dungy's leadership, Warren Sapp and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers perfected the art of defense, turning the perennial losers into a winning franchise. But despite their success, the ultimate prize of a Super Bowl ring still lay beyond their grasp. We had all the ingredients of a champion because Dungy had instilled it. But as much as I love Tony, Tony had a flaw. And it was that he didn't demand that our offense give us more. And I think that was a disservice to the amount of expectation that he had for us as a defense. 2001, that season, just felt we wasn't reaching our potential on one side of the football. For a greater coach as Coach Dungy was and is, change was needed. Our owners, they made a bold play to get John Gruden. Draft picks, cash, 
John Gruden was known for his offense. He had been so successful with the Raiders. If we could match up his offense with our defense, we knew great things could happen. Come on, Marquise, get your ass in here. John Gruden, he pushed us, he motivated us. He said, you guys can be better. And it started with Sapp, it started with Brooks, started with me, he challenged us all in front of everybody else. Every day you build, you put blocks down. I challenged him, if you're really this good, how about scoring some touchdowns on defense? We got a score, he challenged us, he challenged us, we got a score. Oh, ball to the intercepted, intercepted, has got it, laterals, touchdown Derek Brooks. Gruden was the right mix of fun and drive, and we love playing for the man. He made it fun, he really, really made it fun. Let's go tonight, Tampa, let it roll, let it go, let it out of your ass. I needed more from Sapp. I wanted him to play offense. I wanted his football charisma on both sides of the ball. Warren actually had a package name after him, and it was part of our game plan. We're running the white hurricane, but I'm usually blocking. Then we get to Atlanta, and this crazy-ass man wants to throw me the ball. So he grew the legend by allowing him to play tight end, which took him back to his high school days. Warren Sapp for the touchdown. <laughs> and the pogo stick. I mean, is that all he's got? <laughs> he was trying to implement Beyonce's crazy in love dance. What I was doing in practice was a way worse version of the dance than what I did in public. I was doing it like her. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that dance didn't fly high on the Buccaneer charts. <laughs> Play action, the throw. Warren Sapp scores. I used to love saying, why Hurricane? You know, he could impact the game on both sides. He was a real, true throwback football player that could play both ways if you wanted him to. Hey, no grind escape. This is what we want to be. Now I'm let's go do what we do. Dominate on three. One, two, three, Dominate. Dominate. All the pieces came together in that 2002 season. But Sapp and the Bucks still faced one last hurdle. The Philadelphia Eagles had derailed Tampa in the postseason two years running. But not this time. The Buccaneers are the champions of the uh -oh. NFC. How about that? The Yucks were going to the Super Bowl. Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl. Welcome to San Diego, California. Super Bowl 37, it is Tampa Bay versus the Oakland Raiders. Here we go, nine, nine. Somebody done sketch him. Somebody done sketch him. It was no question in our mind that we were going to get this thing done. I mean, I had two Magnum bottles of champagne ready to go. So we go to putting our clothes in plastics. We gonna spray the locker room. We gonna, we gonna wet this thing up when we get back up in here. Here they come! Here they come! Keep your mind on the prize. Let's go. Keep your mind on the prize. Dropping again and looking again and looking again. Those up the middle. That's intercepted at the Derek 40. Brooks. Derek Brooks 30. Brooks on 29. He's good. Derek Brooks all the way. There it is. The dagger's in. Yeah. We're gonna win the Super Bowl. Super Bowl, man! Boom, boom, boom! We weren't surprised at all. Our confidence was incredible. We could have had the Steelers with the steel of curtain. We were winning that game. It, it meant too much to us from where we had come from. And we put a whooping on the Raiders, and it was fun. <laughs> it's great. I mean, great. I mean, we turned Tampa into a champion. And it was absolutely a place where careers went to die. It overtakes you. It really does. You, you, you realize that we're the best football team on the planet. Coming up on A Football Life. Al Davis is on the phone and he said he's not getting off until you're an Oakland Raider. The greatest thing my, my mom taught me was, Jesus Christ was the only perfect man to ever walk the earth, and they hung him on a cross. So you know you are fair game. Y'all go work that shit out, because it's coming right there. You don't want to answer the question, say I don't want to answer the question. No, that's backwards, you dumbass. Which are you facing? 
Well, you know, Warren is very opinionated and sometimes can be outspoken. He's about as dumb as a box of rocks. He didn't turn it on and off. Off the field, he was the same guy. And people had a hard time with that. He'll listen to you and he'll take advice, but in the end, he's gonna do it his way and he's gonna be willing to take the consequences. We needed him to walk that fine line of confidence and cockiness. Let's cut that through. Oh, it's out. Come on. Warren had no fear, none. And uh, if something needed to be said, he would say it. Shut the up. That come from his mama's side. He could be rude at times when he shouldn't be, I think, to a certain point. But that's just Warren. Outspoken, brash, honest, to a fault. Warren Sapp was not often at a loss for words, nor the instinct to share them, for better or worse. Yeah, I call myself an Can be just as ornery, hard-headed, focused, love, dedicated, loyal, all that. But you'll get it, depending on what you bring out of me. I made a choice to carry that persona. I always look for something that was a slight or you're not good enough, and that was my fuel. That was my fuel. At times, the big man and his big personality incited the ire of officials, players, coaches, and the media. There were fines and altercations but there was no bigger controversy in Sapp's career than the hit he put on Green Bay's Chad Clifton in late 2002. Oh, boy, he left his feet, too. I mean, he launched himself. Yet, they look at the lower half of Clifton. Chad Clifton, I want him to get up. But will I not hit him? Hell no, he's gonna take, he's getting it every time. When you get an interception, what do you do? Get your head on a swivel. That's the first rule. Get your head on the swivel. You better look around, because the defender just turned into the offense, and we coming to get you. Was Chad going to make the play? Absolutely not. Warren knew that. Chad knew it. Everyone in the building knew it. It kind of pissed me off. And I know it pissed Chad off. I mean, it almost ended his career. Could you argue and say it was unnecessary? Yes. It's football. If you want to score with an interception or score with a fumble, you're not the only one that finishes the play just because you have the ball. The other 10 of you, you better go get a block. It was well within the rules and the game was going on. So to me, he was just playing the way he always played. He's a tremendous player and I think he always played by the rules. I think in that case, he just, it was a legal hit. You have to remember that it was a legal hit. It was just uncalled for. Packers coach Mike Sherman only aggravated the situation when he confronted Sapp on the field after the game. Both guys were out of line, but I could also see how it happened. It's hard for a coach to go out and challenge a player like that. And then he challenged someone that's not going to back down. I called a spade a spade. Nothing illegal about what I did, but I'm vilified for it. If you know the nature of the beast, don't be surprised by what it does. His brash persona and take no prisoners attitude would fit right into the final chapter of Sapp's football career. Unable to recreate their championship magic in 2003, the fabric of that tightly woven Tampa family began to unravel. My homeboys come in shaking me. Hey, what, what? Rosa House on the phone. What does he want? Yeah. Al Davis is on the phone and he said he's not getting off until you're an Oakland Raider. Now, it would have been great to see him finish his career in Tampa, but the Raiders were kind of fun, you know, because the Raiders with Al Davis kind of had that bad boy image, if you will. And it just seemed like a good fit for him at that stage of his career. One of the most cherished moments I have of, of the whole time I was a Raider, is just sitting there with Mr. Davis, just talking football. Everything about the man was great, everything. 
except his ability to pick a football team all by himself. Despite his best efforts, Sapp was unable to recreate in Oakland the chemistry of that vaunted Tampa defense. Near the end of the 2007 season, in his final contest with an old friend, the veteran trenchman knew his playing days were done. He came out of the huddle. He had that little shimmy. I said, oh, did I know that look. I said, I know this play action pass. I know he's going back to pass. I know that look in a thousand and one years. Hank. Jennings to the right, driver to the left. Barb takes, fakes the handoff. Coolidge came off number 73, and he grabbed my ass. Red Fall play action pad that thing, went back, had a cup of tea, put it up there, took a sip, went up over the top, launched. Rainbow's right side going for Jennings, and he makes the catch! Disengages at the 40, he will go all the way! Touchdown! I said, yep, it's time for me to go home. He told me in that game, this is gonna be it. I think he still had some in the tank. He just needed someone to bring it out of him. He just needed the right environment, the right person to push those buttons, which, which would have been me. I tried to talk him out of retiring, by the way. A number of times they said, Warren, this is a lot of money for you, and you're still a top-notch player. Are you sure you want to do this? And he told me, Drew, I do not want to play this game when I'm not at my best. I made an imprint on this game, and I don't want to tarnish that. He went out in his prime. Up next on A Football Life. When you make the Hall of Fame, you're considered to be the best of all time. What began as a child's backyard passion led a young boy from the dirt fields of Plymouth to fame and glory in the National Football League. For 13 years, he played the game he loved at the highest level, accumulating 96 and a half sacks and one Super Bowl ring. Achieving all the dreams of Dust Bowl fantasy, except one. Ladies and gentlemen, Presenting Warren Sapp for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. When you make the Hall of Fame, you're considered to be the best of all time at what you did for a living. I stand before you today, one humble, proud country boy from Plymouth, Florida. I love this game. I love the passion of it. There's nothing else I know and love is taking me from a dirt road to a gold jacket. Oh my goodness. <laughs> There's a lot of great players, but to me the Hall of Fame is for those guys where you say, I would love to still be able to watch that guy play. You don't go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame without earning it. First ballot, you gotta earn that. Warren changed the game. He changed the way that position was played. He pursued the quarterback relentlessly. He changed the whole complexion of football games. There'll never be another Warren set. I don't think you make seven Pro Bowls. I don't think you turn around a franchise. I don't think you lead a team to the Super Bowl without having that, that great quality. And if you talk to the key players that play this game, they're all going to tell you the same thing. 99 is a beast because he kicked my ass, he kicked their ass, he kicks everybody's ass. I would say that his legacy is second to none, and that's how he should be remembered. A guy that I've known since I was 15 years old is a Hall of Famer. That's what's special to me. I never played this game to get in the Hall of Fame. I played this game to retire my mother. He worked harder than anything and everything he go at. So that was one thing he wanted to accomplish, making me proud. And he has done that. What I want you to say about me is that I was consistent. And I had a game on a Sunday afternoon that you could sit and your grandma could enjoy. I was having a blast. 